This is Fair Mormon Frameworks on the Mormon Faircast. The Fair Mormon Frameworks series seeks to present Latter-day Saints whose grasp or knowledge about a specific topic can help us consider different frameworks within the gospel that lead with faith. I am your host, Bill Real. Now on to part two of our interview with Brad Wilcox. You know, you're talking about all of us having a little bit different view of how it all fits together. And, and you know, as prepping for this interview, you're probably aware that this podcast deals with those who struggle a lot with faith. And one of the things that they struggle with is that within different cultures and different wards, there sometimes is this big giant box of doctrine, and it includes a lot of speculative things and, and other things that they get told by a Sunday school teacher or another person in the ward. And they feel like people build up walls against them because the way in which they make the gospel fit is just a little different than the next person. And I was thinking about Elder Uchtdorf's talk during conference where he talked about us not fitting a mold, that that the diversity within the church is a blessing that helps us. And I just think your comment there kind of speaks at that, that there is there are the basic tenets of the faith. We've got to stay in those. We've got to find a safe place to be within that. But in the realm of specifically how grace works, I don't know that we should build walls up against somebody because one person thinks a little differently. Uh, any thoughts from you on the flexibility we all have in the gospel? Oh, yeah. I mean, right now, there there are some people that literally will go to battle about where the Book of Mormon took place. I mean, there are members of the church that will lay down their lives for one theory or another. Right. And I just think it's a little ridiculous as we get so focused on something that peripheral and we're missing the whole meaning of the book, which is not where it took place, but how it is testifying of Christ and helping us become more Christ-like. Um, one missionary in my mission one time said, President, I don't even want to bring investigators to church. And I said, well, that's kind of a problem, Elder, because that's your job. And he says, but I don't want to bring them because he says, our ward is awful. The little kids run around and this lady is so weird and she's in everybody's business. And this guy over here, he's like hung up on this doctrinal thing. And every time he opens his mouth, he says the same thing. And this guy over here is all mad because some general authority said you shouldn't drink Coke. And so he's all mad and went inactive because somebody said he shouldn't drink Coke. And he says, are you kidding? He says, I'm going to bring people to this mess of a war and tell them, yeah, you want to be a part of this? He <laughs> says, no. He says, I think the ward ought to get its act together first, and then I'll bring new investigators. I said, no. I said, wait. I said, go back with me in time. Let's go back to when Jesus was on the earth. Whether it was in the old world or in the new world, let's go back. You think those congregations were perfect? You think they didn't have crying babies? You think they didn't have a few Pharisees in there that were just really steeped in their Jewish traditions? You, you don't think that there is somebody who came who said, gosh, we shouldn't be nice to the Romans. They're the ones that are taking us over. Um, I mean, come on. There were people back then who had opinions. And there were people back then who were mixing politics with religion. And I can't even imagine being one of the first uh, Gentile converts who thought, am I going to have to be circumcised? I mean, <laughs> whoa, there's a test of faith for you. <laughs> I mean, I mean, <laughs> you, you go back and you think the church must have struggled with this in its day, just as we struggle with it. But how short-sighted would the person have been to say, I don't want to meet with Peter, James, and John. I don't want to meet with these apostles because somebody out there, you know, offended me and said that my goat is making too much noise in my yard. I mean, come on. This is a chance to mingle with apostles. This is a chance to, to build each other up. This is a chance to create a Zion community. And I just think, Sometimes maybe we forget that we want that Zion community to already be in existence, and we forget that we're part of building that Zion community. And I'm sure glad Jesus didn't refuse to come be with us because we're all a bunch of jerks. I'm sure glad Jesus didn't say, well, I don't want to go and be with those people because, gosh, they're like way below me in their gospel knowledge. And I'm certainly glad Jesus didn't say, 
oh, come on, I'm not, I'm not going to do the Sermon on the Mount because they won't even understand it. And this lady over here is talking to her friend right during the sermon. And this guy over here is playing on his iPhone and I'm giving the Sermon on the Mount. So I'm not even going to give the sermon because he's just playing on his iPhone. I mean, come on. I think, I think we have to kind of look past all that and be able to say, let's don't miss the forest for the trees. Awesome. The, uh, the analogy that you're most known for is the child taking piano lessons, which I thought was just beautiful. Can I, can I ask you where it, you kind of hit on that or when you made that connection? Bill, first of all, let me compliment you. Um, the questions you've asked me, the things we've talked about in this interview are very meaningful to me. And you have hit right at the core of some of my most pivotal lifetime experiences. Africa, my mission, a chance to serve with Elder Holland. I mean, and now talking about these doctrines, I mean, you, you're, you're a good little interviewer. And well, thank you because you definitely have gotten me talking. In fact, talking too much. There's some listener out there going, "Oh, good grief! Shut that man up." Uh, I don't think so. But, <laughs> okay, but I'm, I'm I'm very grateful for you to ask a question like that. Many people have talked to me about that analogy, but no one has ever before asked me where that came from. And I have to be totally honest with you, and I have to tell you that it was a gift. It was literally a gift from heaven. I was in the basement of the Harabili Library where I had found a little room that was empty and I would keep escaping to that room because, I don't know, um, sometimes it's a little hard for me to find a private moment. I am a people person. I love people. Many of the students come to BYU having met me at EFY and so they just always love to come and talk to me and and I love to talk to them. I love to help them with their problems. And I love to listen to them when they're feeling homesick and missing home. And, and when they're deciding whether to go on a mission or not. And I mean, you know, I love, I love my work there at BYU because I work with all these young people and I just love them to death. But it does make private moments, writing moments, um, difficult to find. And I had kind of stolen away down here into the basement of the Harold B. Lee Library, and I was trying desperately to think about how could I teach this relationship with Christ and his focus on improvement? How could I teach this in a way that that would would be a little more meaningful than buying something? See, the, the analogies that I'd always heard were buying something. Well, that just didn't help me because you buy something and it's bought, it's done, it's over. Or you hear analogies about the atonement being a ladder out of the pit. Okay, so I climb the ladder, I'm out of the pit, it's done. Or you hear the atonement being a bridge across a chasm. All right, I crossed the bridge, Christ built the bridge, I crossed the bridge. And see, all these analogies just didn't match with what I was thinking as far as this relationship, not just a, he built the ladder, I have to climb it. He built the bridge, I have to cross it. He, we fell from heaven, he's going to get us back to heaven. His part, our part. And see, all those analogies just didn't quite fit because I thought, one, it makes it sound as if it's a one-time deal. He did his part, now I have to do my part. And, and it doesn't address the idea that He's not just getting us out of a pit or across a bridge, or he's not just buying a bike. He's teaching us to learn how to ride the bike and to get up every time we fall off the bike. He's teaching us to go up that ladder and to even keep climbing once we've slipped back to the bottom. He's teaching us to cross that chasm to higher ground, not just cross the chasm and be where we were before, but to get to higher ground. And as I was just playing with all of these things, it was just a gift. Awesome. And it was a, it was one of the most powerful moments of personal revelation that I have ever had. And suddenly it just clicked. It's like taking piano lessons, which my mom just laughs about because I took piano lessons for many years 
and I was the one who refused to practice. And she says, oh, now, Brad, you're the one out there talking about piano practice. And she says, you were the one that never wanted to practice. I think maybe that's why I can relate to that, because I'm the one that struggled for so many years trying to learn piano and never quite learned it. But uh, but that was a that was a gift. Why piano lessons? I don't know. You know, now that I think in that direction, it could be practicing for a basketball game. It could be practicing cooking. It could be practicing. I mean, now that practicing idea could go into many different things. But when when that revelation was felt, when that inspiration came, it was piano lessons. And you're right. I think a lot of people have been able to relate to that because it's an experience that many of us have. And, and practicing is difficult. It's not easy. But I think that's a concept that we can grasp and that Jesus is helping us practice. He's not waiting for us to become concert pianists. He's the one that's sitting there on the bench with us and helping us through that process. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's the first time I heard that talk, and I've listened to it over and over. <clears throat> it seems like such a simple analogy, and yet so profound in ways that you can tie the mom into the Savior. You can tie, uh, you know, obviously when you talk about not making Carnegie Hall, and that means we have to quit, and, and how sometimes we see ourselves in the realm of the gospel. I find it interesting, I don't know if you noticed or not, but it seemed like Elder Uchtdorf seemed to be borrowing that same principle in his conference talk, The Four Titles from the Priesthood Session, when he spoke about a toddler learning to walk. And, and your talk also obviously made the, the new era, right? Grace is Sufficient was in the new era recently. Are we seeing a shift in the church on how we perceive works in grace? Again, as I said before, it's not new doctrine. It's right. Not. But I do think that leaders at all levels, and if, if, if I, if anything I ever said has helped Elder Uchtdorf prepare a talk, then I am nothing but honored. If Elder Uchtdorf understood that and was using his own inspiration that happened to match mine, then I am honored that my inspiration might match the inspiration of an apostle. I love Elder Uchtdorf, and I don't know whether he was making the connection that you're making. I felt the same thing as I was sitting there listening. I thought, oh, this is so healthy. This is so refreshing to hear this from a general authority. It's what I told Emily Watts years ago. Get some general authority to write this. Right. And it was so refreshing because Elder Uchtdorf's voice is heard worldwide. And Brad Wilcox's isn't. Brad Wilcox's voice is not heard worldwide. My voice is heard by a very small circle. But Elder Uchtdorf's voice is heard by a very large circle. And if he can teach that concept, and he did beautifully, then he can be bringing hope to people who will never, ever hear of Brad Wilcox or never, ever read my book. And that makes me thrilled that we can be on the same team and that I, for just a short set, short moment, am playing on in the same team as a Michael Jordan like Elder Uchtdorf. If I can even be playing the same game as him, then I'm just very honored. And the fact that he taught and that some of the other brethren are also teaching some of these principles is is uh, is very uh, hopeful because I think people see them as the voice of authority, as they should. And mm -hmm. when they hear that authoritative voice of the church teaching about grace and teaching about this perfecting process, even Elder Bednar's talk in the last general conference about the difference between testimony and real conversion, and how it's a process. Even in this general conference, as Elder Holland spoke so lovingly about the boy who said, I can only believe, I can't say I know. And yet Elder Holland hugged him and said, you're on the path, you're on the right track. These are wonderful messages that buoy up all of our souls and strengthen all of our hearts. And whether that testimony is coming, wherever that testimony is coming from, wherever those teachings are coming from, um, may we gravitate to them and may we hear those voices, voices from the scriptures, voices from the brethren, voices from LDS teachers. May we hear all those voices in a grand chorus as marvelous as the Tabernacle Choir singing a song of 
redemption, singing a song of hope, and singing a song of Christ. Awesome. I want to kind of maybe work towards wrapping up. I want to share with you some questions that some listeners sent in to me to ask you. You bet. Okay. The first one, does it get tiresome being confused? <clears throat> Sorry. Does it get tiresome being confused with the Brad Wilcox, who's the director of National Marriage Project at UVA? You know, I'm not sure. I, I am confused with him often, but I'm not sure whether he's even LDS. Is he? I, I don't know, and I don't think so. He spoke at BYU campus not too long ago in defense of traditional marriage. And Did they mean to ask you, and he just somehow got the invitation? He was invited by somebody <laughs> else. Several people called me and said, I can't wait to come to your lecture on traditional marriage. <laughs> and I thought, well, I didn't know I was giving one. Uh, it's been funny. He he uh, He's an incredible scholar, and he, he has published and researched so much. Uh, but, I mean, I'm honored to be, if people think that I'm him, I'm honored because he's awesome. And so uh, I, I think he's probably the one who gets very discouraged if he gets mistaken for me. Because he, that's a real step down for him. Um, I often get asked also in church circles if I'm related to S. Michael Wilcox. And he is also a teacher I admire a lot. He's a speaker and writer that I just love. Uh, but we're not related. He gets kind of mad because he's not that much older than I am, but people always go up to him and say, are you Brad Wilcox's dad? And he it makes him laugh because he says, no, I'm not your dad. Uh, he says at least they should think we're brothers. And uh, and anyway, he's a great friend, marvelous teacher, but we haven't found a connection in all of our efforts to try to find which polygamist we came from. <laughs> right. Well, if it makes him feel any better, you can let him know that I thought he was your older brother. I didn't, <laughs> that was you. I just saw the two of you giving talks and writing books, and I figured the two got to be connected. Uh, You'll be on his good list for that. Good, good. But he's a he's a great teacher, but I'm not I'm not connected with him either. So so either way, I guess uh, I'm honored if I'm connected with either one of those men. The uh, the next question, one of the listeners asked that Brad's wife is a RN, something my wife is seriously considering pursuing. What advice can he share about that profession in regards to time commitment, work schedules, joys and downsides? Because I was a teacher, I taught elementary school for three years before teaching at BYU, um, we never enjoyed the, the possibility of living off one single income. In fact, one of the reasons I got involved with EFY was because it was something I could do during the summer um, when I was teaching during the year. So ever since we've been married, my wife has always worked part-time until we were called on our mission to Chile. Uh, she never worked full-time. But nursing was a great career for her because it did allow her to earn a good wage for a, uh, in a part-time job. And that was enough to supplement our income and allowed us to survive. She also would be the first to tell you that she loved the work. She loved helping people in that way. And she loved when the children were young. She loved having a chance to just have a few hours during the week where she could break away and deal with grown-ups and not be completely forever surrounded by toddlers. Um, she also uh, was such a great nurse that my son has followed her into that profession. He's now working as an RN in San Antonio in, the, in an ICU there. Um, and so uh, she set, definitely had an influence on my kids and, and uh, helping my son choose his career. But when we came back, when we left on our mission, she had to give up her job. They wouldn't hold it for her for three years. And so she went ahead and resigned her position. Um, and when we came back, she thought she would jump back into nursing, but she never did. She, when we came back, she said, um, you know what? The kids are going through a big transition. Uh, I had two middle schoolers in Chile who were going to be going into high school. I had a son who'd just gotten back from a mission. I had a daughter who was just graduating from BYU. She said, I just really think I better stick around for a couple of years and make sure that we don't drop any balls here. So she was very wise to do that, and she was able to help keep our family focused and strong during some of those transitional years. And now she has enjoyed so much helping with grandchildren that she says, I don't want to go back to full-time work. And it's been uh, it's been a blessing to our family 
to to be able to have her now home. So my wife would be one to defend women staying at home and see the value in that. But my wife would also be one to stand up and defend women who are working to help supplement incomes and women who are working to support single parent families. My wife would be an advocate for both. Uh, and I guess finally that would lead her to say there are times and seasons in our lives. And she has enjoyed a time and season to work. She's also enjoyed a time and season to be a mom and a grandma. So, so, um, yeah, she has loved that. And it's been a real blessing in our lives. And it was a blessing on our missions, believe me. When we were on our mission and to have a mission president's wife who was a nurse, uh, really helped make a difference. She helped a lot of young people. Good, good. This person also asked a follow-up question, which was, do you have any sense that CES is changing to allow more women to work in the program, particularly women with children? I don't know because I don't work with CES. That's another mistake that I hear often as people meet me. They, they think that I'm a religion teacher. They think that I'm a seminary teacher, an institute teacher. And I'm honored by that because I have great admiration for those who work with seminary and institute. Um, my brother is a seminary teacher. He has taught at Provo High. He taught at Timview High in Provo. He just got transferred next year to American Fork. Um, and he loves teaching seminary, but I've never worked with that program, so I don't know if we're seeing shifts. I do know that uh, that there are some some uh, lines that they still have about seminary teachers being married, uh, and I I uh, know that there's still some lines about women with young children uh, and uh, not being able to teach full time. Many early morning seminary teachers, many part time seminary teachers are also mothers, but I know that there are some lines that SNI is preserving. But I, I'm not really one who's in a place to speak to why those are either changing or not changing. Uh, I'm just an observer who's watching it from the outside. Now, you currently serve on the General Sunday School Board, correct? Yes, that's been a beautiful calling. Uh, one of the questions the listeners had is, what role did you play in the new youth curriculum? And then they followed it up with, can you expect similar, can we expect similar developments with other Sunday school courses? And then they asked a couple of others too. They said, what reactions has the board received and what are the best practices for implementing the new program? Uh, wonderful questions. I don't know that I even knew what a general board was before I was called to one. But these auxiliary presidencies, young men, young women, primary, Sunday school, the presidencies, uh, are in charge of training, and they do a lot of training worldwide. The, they then are instrumental in helping to call a board, so each organization has a small board of of people who kind of keep the home fires burning. While they're away doing a lot of worldwide mm-hmm. training, the board is in charge of working with some of the day-to-day aspects of the organizations, including the new youth curriculum. And so... um this was the first time in the history of the church that the young men organization, young women, and Sunday school, and seminary all sat down at the same table. That was so amazing to me that that had not happened previously. And maybe it had happened casually previously, um, but this was the first time that formally all those organizations stepped out of their silos and into a a setting in which they were cooperating and working together. And it's been beautiful to see Sister Elaine Dalton, President Beck, President Russell Oskathorpe of the Sunday School, <coughs> and, and the leaders of the Seminary and Institute, Elder Johnson, the, the Commissioner of Education. They all work together, and they have really set their own egos aside, their own self-interests or organizational interests aside, and they have really pulled together and worked very closely with the brethren. Elder Hales, even in his frailty and in through his illnesses, has really been a powerful voice advocating for this new youth curriculum. And I honestly would dare say that we sure wouldn't have it if Elder Hales hadn't have been the one to to present the vision 
and to help guide through this creative process. Um, it's been marvelous to watch. And, uh, and the church is not known for moving quickly on some of these kind of program issues. And yet this moved extremely quickly. I didn't really understand why until President Monson made his announcement that changed the world by lowering the mission ages. And at that same conference, that's when the announcement of Come Follow Me was made. And having worked behind the scenes a little bit with this, having helped with some of the piloting of this, I was just amazed when all of that came together. And to sit back and say, wow, uh, there was a lot more going on behind the scenes that none of us were aware of. And this curriculum was needed in an effort to help prepare young people for earlier service. And so all that came together beautifully. And uh, the results, yeah, they're seeing some problems. They're seeing some issues. They're seeing some traditional teachers in the church who are having a little hard time kind of shifting focus. But they're also seeing great success worldwide. Um, the curriculum is truly allowing for some incredible growth and participation for the youth. Um, and, uh, and, and so they're getting good feedback from all over the world, some marvelous things happening, and it's exciting. It, it's exciting to see it. I went to a fireside the other day, and I said to the parents, I said, I said, parents, listen to this. And then I said to the youth, I said, youth, what did you learn about in Sunday school in January? They all said, Godhead. Then I said, what did you learn in February? I said, plan of salvation. What did you learn in March? We learned about the um, uh, atonement. What did you learn in April? Apostasy and restoration. And then I looked over at the parents and I said, a year ago, could your kid have told you what he learned in Sunday school from two months ahead, three months before? I said, a year ago, could your kid have told you what he learned in Sunday school that very day? And all the adults were just laughing because they realized that, no, he couldn't have. And yet now they're learning this in such a way that they are internalizing these core doctrines. And do we have a ways to go? Yes. The board right now is working feverishly with the presidency and others to try to prepare a teacher preparation course that we've had the teacher development course in the past, but some are finding that very long and hard to take people through. So we're working on a course that would be about four weeks or four lessons that would kind of help teachers adjust to this different approach in church classrooms and the idea of not following the manual, where most of our previous focus was on stick with the manual, follow the manual. And this would help teachers understand needs and try to meet those needs. So that's in the works. And yes, in answer to the question, they are hoping that this more active learning will become a part of church classes at all levels. And so I think stay tuned because there are some wonderful things being generated right now that will affect gospel doctrine classes and, uh, and also even primary classes, priesthood classes. And it's exciting to see that happening and to be a part of it, a small part. I know my listeners will be grateful to hear that one of the, the things that those who run into a faith crisis or struggle with their faith, what they encounter is that they go through their Sunday lessons, and then sometime 20 years later, they encounter some piece of factual information on church history that nobody ever nobody ever talked to them about or spoke about or shared with them, and they feel surprised by it. And, and much of that is because of the constraints of the old manual where you had a specific lesson, you had to stay on a specific point, there was too much to cover in one class. And now with this new way of doing things, there's a lot more flexibility. If, if somebody is learning about the apostasy and restoration and they encounter some difficult question, there's now this openness to be able to come forward and say that. So yes. from on behalf of my listeners, thank you. We just appreciate greatly the opportunity to, if something's on our mind or something we're struggling with, there's now a way and room to, to ask some hard questions. Yeah, the, the themes, the themes, the monthly themes provide an umbrella so that we are kind of unified as a church. But under that umbrella, teachers and learners, Sunday school presidents, bishops, we are feeling a freedom underneath these, uh, these themes. There is a freedom that we've never felt before. And you're right. It, it is opening up 
the door for deeper and more substantial learning and teaching in the church. And I appreciate and applaud teachers, Sunday school presidents, youth leaders who are out there who are making this happen and who are really uh, on the front lines implementing this, learning from mistakes and just moving this forward. Because within the the teachings of this new youth curriculum, I think we really will find the tools to be able to help young people and strengthen them to a point that perhaps later in life they won't feel like they were just taught uh, uh, an agenda rather than seeing their real needs and questions, uh, oh, you know, addressed. I was in a training for the Sunday school in a Latino state here in Salt Lake, and one sister said to me, Pres-, she said, Brother Wilcox, can't the prophet count? And I said, what do you mean? She said, well, as I look at the Sunday school outlines for the new youth curriculum, there's six different activities, and there's only four weeks. She says, can't he count? Why are there six activities and there's four weeks? And I said, no, honey. I said, sister, the prophet can count. He knows there's four weeks in a month, but he is not saying this happens on week one, this happens on week two. I said, those outlines are just a suggestion. Now you look at the needs of your learners and you can stay on one lesson idea for the whole month. Or you can teach four of the six. Or you can teach uh, two of the six. Or you can take those ideas and set them aside. And you can, under the theme, within the topic, you can teach things that aren't even given on that paper. And she just was flabbergasted. Because ever since she joined the church, it was, you know, follow the manual, ask this question, get this answer. And now she was saying, wow, I'm really being treated with, uh, you know, with much more trust. And I said, yes, you are. Yes, the prophet can count. And yes, the prophet trusts us with this incredible opportunity. So I hope we don't blow it. No, the only concern I would have would be our priesthood. Uh, they're used to having a manual that they can just pick up that morning and read from. And uh, and they're obviously going to have to prepare now uh, a few days in advance at least. One Sunday so school, as that comes down the pipe. One Sunday school teacher said the same to me. He said, thanks for ruining my life. He says, I used to read my lesson during sacrament meeting and then teach it the next hour. And he says, now I can't do that anymore. I said, good. I've got uh, four more questions from listeners, and then I want to ask one final one. And then I want to I want to talk about your book for just a brief moment. Um, the last four are this. The first one is, what ways do you recommend uh, to help us better understand grace? Are there specific books you, you think we should read, certain scriptures we should focus on, certain experiences? Uh, or perspectives. What do, what do you have to offer um, outside of the books you've written, which obviously I would recommend to any listener who's, who catches this uh, this interview. What things outside of things you've done do you find would be helpful to my listeners to better understand grace? You know, that's easy to answer because all they'd have to do is look at all the people I've quoted. Um, as they look at the bibliography in the back of the book, they will see the very books that helped me start putting some of these puzzle pieces together in my mind. Grace Works by by Millet was a real uh, a real key for me. Um, the uh, Amazing Grace by Jorgensen. It's an older book, but that was very helpful. Um, I loved uh, the Broken Heart. In fact, the whole the whole three book series from Elder Hafen and his wife um, that was very helpful. I loved With Full Purpose of Heart by Elder Oaks. That was a beautiful book that uh, that helped, you know, kind of focus some of my ideas in this in this particular, you know, realm of of doctrine. So those are some that that uh, Pure in Heart by Elder Oaks was another one that was very helpful for me. Um, I I think another one that uh, oh gosh, there's so many that that I love, but I think. Dealing specifically with grace, I think those are the ones that really started my brain thinking in a different direction and kind of caused a paradigm shift for me. Now, like you say, hymns, the scriptures are full of grace. But honestly, I'd read scriptures and sung hymns my whole life, but it was these books that kind of shifted my paradigm where I could see the grace 
the redemption the the that was being taught in scriptures and and hymns. So those are some good ones. And if you need an actual reference for them, they're all listed there in the back of my my book. So that would give you the year, the publication year, the publisher, the exact title. I mean, then I think you'd be able to find it easier. My podcast deals again with people who struggle with faith. And I think on some level, we all have to at some point, we all have to kind of be pushed out into the darkness because to exercise faith really requires us to have some resistance to that. Any ideas on how to support people uh, going th- through a faith crisis or through other trials? And this person even put in parentheses, I'm interested in the most critical things to do or not to do. Any thoughts along those lines? Well, I think about uh, what Elder Anderson said, not in this latest general conference, but in the previous one, where he said, when the storm comes, don't leave the shelter. And then that was kind of reiterated by Elder Holland this time, as he said, look, don't leave the church because of things you don't know. Don't abandon what you do know. He said, just realize that you're in a process of learning and growing. And I think that that's very good advice. I think the scariest thing that we do is that we we feel a crisis of faith or we feel unanswered questions or we read something about church history and that freaks us out. And all of a sudden, we just want to step away from everything that we have loved, that we cherish, that we know to be good and true. And I think instead we just need to realize, hey, look, I can stay in this shelter and I can face the storms within the shelter. I talked about how my mission had been such a turning point for me. And I think that part of that was because I struggled with doubts and questions that I had never encountered previously in my growing up Mormon life. But I struggled with those doubts within the mission, within the shelter of having a mission president who was willing to talk through some of those doubts and issues with me. Instead of leaving my mission because all of a sudden I had a doubt, instead of leaving the church because suddenly I wondered whether God even existed, within those cushioned and safe environments, I was able to deal with those doubts and deal with them in a positive way. Um, Some of you will remember Mark Hoffman and the big scandal that was created when he presented a lot of forgeries to the church as authentic historic documents. As I've read a little bit more about him, I think it's so interesting. President Hinckley was one who, when he first see Hoffman would think, Well, if the church is willing to pay money or donors, it wasn't often the church. It was donors who were donating money to acquire these documents and then donating the documents to the church. But he said, gosh, if people are willing to pay big money for historic documents that substantiate the church, then, whoa, won't they be willing to pay a lot of money for documents that are negative and then hide those documents? Well, I think that reasoning shows his own mentality, but he certainly underestimated the church and leaders who recognized the truthfulness of the church. Because when he created the salamander letter, saying that Joseph Smith had seen some, what was it, a white, white right. salamander, and that, that, that that's how he got the plates or some, some bizarre thing. Um, oh my gosh. He took that to President Hinckley and said, do you want to buy this? And President Hinckley said, no, we don't have any interest in that. He said, well, if you don't, I'll take it to the press. I'll take it out to the press. President Hinckley said, fine, that's not going to phase us. It's, I mean, that he says, obviously, that doesn't have any. I think it's so interesting. I, I wasn't a part of those meetings, but I think it's so interesting that President Hinckley said, no, we don't want to buy this. And no, we have no interest in hiding it away. Because President Hinckley knows that a testimony of truth is based on something much more than the existence of physical evidence or the non-existence of physical evidence or the existence of anti-Mormon evidence. He knows that a testimony is so much more than that. So he told him he wasn't going to buy the letter. And so Mark Hoffman, true to his word, made it public, which then led to his downfall because he made this public, which brought it under a great deal of scrutiny. But the reason I'm telling this story is because I had a lady in my home ward who left the church over that letter. She claimed that that was the reason she left the church. And she said, 
there's no way I can suck this in. There's no way I can believe this. There's no way I can make sense of this. Obviously, the church is true. And she left the church. And with that, all the blessings of the church that she was so willing to just give up because of this stupid salamander letter. I went to my brother who teaches seminary and I said, Roger, what the heck? I mean, what the heck is this? And is this legitimate? And my brother was very wise. He says, Brad, he says, put it on the shelf. He says, don't read too much into it. He says, give it some time and let's see where this goes. He says, don't try to defend it. Don't try to ignore it or, or don't try to fight against it. He says, just put it on the shelf. He says, this is a puzzle piece. And when you don't fit a puzzle piece in, you don't throw it away and you don't throw the puzzle away. You just put the puzzle piece off to the side until you get a little more information, a little more context, a little bigger picture, and then you see where the puzzle piece fits in or if it is a piece of a different puzzle that doesn't even fit in. Well, my brother's advice was wise, and I took it. And then years later, years later, when that whole thing was proven a forgery, I just had to laugh. I just thought my brother was right. Here was a puzzle piece that didn't even fit. And if it was a weird puzzle piece that would have fit with more context, then that would have been helpful. But I've always felt sorry for this lady who left the church, who then later her husband left the church, not because of the same issue, but just because he got lazy. And if his wife wasn't going and if he wasn't, she wasn't there to take him, then he stopped going. And I think of all the blessings of church membership and discipleship and community and fellowship that they missed because of that stupid salamander letter, which was a total forgery. So I guess the advice is let's face our battles and our doubts within the circle of the church. Let's face our bad habits and our weaknesses within the support circle of the church and not outside. Would you, the the next question was kind of a follow-up to that one, and it talks about how do we help prepare our children or other people we love to deal with a faith crisis in the future. And you addressed some of that in the way you just um, explained the answer to the previous question. But what I would add to that is, is there anything we can do as parents to maybe set up our children to be more flexible, to also recognize that there might be things outside of church curriculum that that still have some truth to them, but maybe need to be put in context better than what those who are critical of our faith do? Are there any suggestions along those lines? Yeah, I uh, I think the two suggestions are one for us as adults and two for other people. First of all, as adults, I think we need to kind of not take a faith crisis at face value. I mean, we hear somebody say, there is no God, or the church isn't true, or I looked up on the Internet and I found this stuff about Joseph Smith and it proves the church isn't true. And boy, we just want to jump in and we want to correct that. We want to prove there's a God. We want to prove the church is true. We want to prove that Joseph Smith walked on water. We want to just go in there and we want to just um, contradict all of that. And I think as adults, as parents, if we can kind of step back and realize that often these doubts are not a sign of weakness as much as they're a sign of growth. And if we're willing to kind of step back and say, let's give a little space here. Let's give a little space for the kid to learn to walk. And we know that means he's going to fall down a little bit. And we know that means he's going to get hurt. But we're going to give him space to walk a little on his own. And to know that we're there with our outstretched hands saying, come on, walk to me, walk to me. But we're not going to keep the kid in our arms. We're not going to hold that kid in our arms. Because the image of a father still holding a 16-year-old boy in his arms because he doesn't want him to fall learning to walk, that smacks more of abuse than it does of loving parenting. So I think we have to kind of step back, give a little space, and realize that some of these doubts and some of these questions kind of come with the territory when you look at growth and progress. Okay, now, on the other side of that, as I am the child learning to walk, walk toward God. Walk toward the parent. Walk with God. Walk with the parent. Don't run the other way. Don't leave the shelter where you can get help and run in the opposite direction. So I always tell young people, don't look down in shame. 
look up for the help of your Savior. And don't look sideways for excuses. Look up for help. And that's the advice I would give here too. Let me wrap up this way. I want to, I want to pass the, you offered to give a uh, autographed copy of your book, The Continuous Conversion, to a listener. And then before we started this interview, you offered to do it for a couple of listeners. Yeah, let's and do so, it. Let's do it for two or three. I'd love that. Okay. So what we'll do then is if, uh, if you want to do it for three, let's just pick three numbers between, um, one and ten. And I've got ten names of people who sent, uh, their information in who asked to be put in the drawing for your book. And so I'll let you go ahead and pick those three numbers and uh, I'll let you know who won. All right. Let's go. Let's go to the extremes, one and ten, and then let's go right down the middle, five. Okay. Excellent. So our first winner is Bobby Corrigan. Our second winner is Haley Mullinex, M-O-L-Y-N-E-U-X. M-O-L-Y-N-U-E-X. N-E-U-X, I'm sorry. N-E-U-X, okay. And then the third winner is Rebecca Young. And when this interview's over, I'll send you their uh, their addresses and information, and you can uh, you can then send them the book. Uh, they'll be uh, quite excited to hear that. Yeah, and and if you've got if you've got the spelling, two of their first names, and I'd like to personalize the books for them. So make sure I get those too. And yep. Bobby and Haley and Rebecca, thank you for listening. Gosh, that's pretty good of you to even listen for this long. But thank you. And if these books can be helpful to you or to someone you love, then I send it with love. Awesome. That's great. And I want to finish with just a a little bit more insight into how I I came upon you. And then I want to conclude with one last question. When I was, I was called to be a bishop four and a half years ago. And I joined the church at the age of 17. I encountered some critical material even before my baptism. And so I had to kind of struggle with the questions throughout my time in the church. And it got to a point about a year and a half in of being bishop, two years in. I'm sitting down with youth and I'm talking to them. People are coming to me for advice, as as a lot of people do, uh, to go see their bishop when they're struggling with something. And the way I saw grace, in my, in the way I used the way I used to see it, was as Brother Millet talks about this works righteousness. And I thought I just had to to beat my head against the wall enough times and perfect myself. And yet when people would come in to see me as the bishop and talk to me, I found that I was sharing a different view that I didn't have a testimony of intellectually, but that I had a testimony of in my heart, which is the view that you um, that you share. Yeah, kind of saying, hang in there, keep trying, you're doing okay. You got it. And But, I, but intellectually, I, I didn't see that view myself. I had this view that we had to just work ourselves to death. And it came to a point where I kind of just hit this valley, and I was just deeply struggling. And I almost, in the back of my head, made this promise to myself that I was going to hang in there if only to help other people, including my family, get back to Heavenly Father, but I didn't think I was going to make it. And it was at that point I asked Heavenly Father if he would help me. And so what I did was I got my MP3 player, and I went online to BYU Speeches, and I started downloading talks. And I didn't have any certain subject I was looking up or any specific speaker. I just I just went in prayerfully looking. And one of the talks that I downloaded was yours. And I remember listening to it on the way back and forth to work. And in my job, I go out and visit different homes, and, and I get to drive around a lot, so I take my MP3 player with me. And the moment I heard your talk, it was just absolutely a game changer for me. And it just it made the doctrine of Christ, and it made grace something that I could not only relate to, but now all of a sudden I could access it personally, and I didn't feel like I was somebody who wasn't cutting it. So I just want to say thank you, Brad. Bishop, thank you. And you know, I, if uh, if you were the only one who were affected, was affected in that way, it, it would make all of the thinking, all of the work, all of the speaking worth it. If if you were the only one who was able to feel hopeful because of that, then it would have been worth it. And I'm just so grateful that Heavenly Father put that into your hands at the minute when you needed that most. I appreciate that. I want to follow that up with my own view being changed then. I put together a fireside, uh, a fifth Sunday lesson in church actually, where I put a PowerPoint presentation on where I showed the things I had learned from you and then adding to that some things from Brother Millet and from Brother Robinson. And I finished up about a half hour lesson and then I went into a video, first 17 minutes of your talk, His Grace is Sufficient. And when that lesson was over, um, 
several brethren were in tears, multiple sisters were in tears, and it finally clicked for them as well. And so, again, um, if you think, you know, I, I recognize what you say, and I, yes, I, I understand the value it has if, if just one person benefits, but your talk has been um, been amazing throughout the church. I think on BYU speeches, in just the short time it's been on there, it is one of the top five most listened to talks on the entire site. So thank you for all you do, Brad. Well, it's very humbling to me. And you know now after this interview that I acknowledge that so much of what I have taught has been a gift, a gift from other teachers who taught me and a gift from God. So I am grateful for your kind words, but I definitely recognize that that in many cases here, I have just been a, a very... Uh, very small instrument in uh, in teaching this message. The uh, the final question I want to wrap up with is: among my listeners are people again who struggle. Some are spouses of folks who no longer believe and they've left the church. And these spouses are hurting; they don't know how much longer they can hold on. I have other listeners who who want faith so bad and they seek it and they plead for it and they struggle to find it. Each of them are in need of God's grace. Any thoughts on uh, what you would say to them? Um, in just one brief statement, I'll quote one of the students in my mission prep class a couple semesters ago, who's now a missionary serving in Florida, by the way. But this young man, in one of his papers, stated something so beautifully that I ended up quoting it in my new book. He said, I used to see myself working toward Christ as the goal. But now I see myself working with Christ toward our goals. And that's made all the difference. And I think if we, as we deal with people we love who are struggling, people we love who have lost their way, and we just want to give up, we have to remember what this young man verbalized. The goal isn't just to work toward Christ or toward full activity in the church, or toward self-betterment. The goal is to work with Christ toward those goals. It's not working toward Christ as the goal, but working with Christ, with God, with the influence of the Spirit, toward our goals, whatever those worthy goals might be. Christ isn't waiting, withholding his help, until we prove worthy of it. Christ, God, and the Spirit are willing to help us here and now. When we hear or read the phrase, come unto me, or even the new youth curriculum, come follow me, would we please in our minds add to those phrases, come right now, come as you are, Don't come once you've got it all put together and you've got all your children active in the church. Come now and let me help you and help them toward these wonderful goals that we have. And I'll just let that be that young man's statement, be my final statement. And I testify that it's true. God is willing to help us all along the path. Perfect people don't need a savior. We need a Savior, and he's there for us. He's not just there for perfect people who have it all together. He's there for us. On the back of the new book, it says, Heaven is not a prize for the perfect. It is the future home of all who are willing to be perfected. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Beautiful. Brad Wilcox was our guest today, author of The Continuous Atonement and his new book, The Continuous Conversion. Um, Thank you so much, Brother Wilcox, for taking time to be with us. Thank you, Bill. You have been so great to talk to. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Mormon Faircast. If there is an issue that you've been wondering about, you can often find the latest answers at the Fair Mormon Wiki, found at fairmormon.com.